Welcome to this video lecture. We are going to continue talking about convection and specifically we're going to solve some example problems to demonstrate how the information from that last lecture can actually be useful in solving real problems. If you recall from the last time, we looked at how the analytical solution to flow over a flat plate was, uh, was solved for and we came up with some equations to get things like the velocity boundary layer thickness, the thermal boundary layer thickness, and most importantly the Nusselt number which is an, a dimensionless heat transfer coefficient which is going to be really important for um, solving heat transfer problems for convection. So this is a, an interactive problem or a thought problem. I just want you to th uh, think this through a little bit. If air and engine oil, each at 300 Kelvin, are flowing over a flat plate at the same velocity in separate experiments, which fluid would you expect to have a thicker velocity boundary layer? So give this some thought. Feel free to pause if you'd like. So here we have flow over a flat plate. So in one of these we would have oil, and in another one we would have air. So when this uh, bulk velocity um, or this free, free stream hits this what's called the leading edge of the plate, we know that there are going to be viscous forces. So we may expect a no, what's called a no-slip boundary condition at the bottom. So we may have essentially zero velocity right there at the interface of the fluid. But then as that uh, as that the fluid has a viscosity which means it creates shear stresses so this stationary solid is going to grab onto that fluid and slow it down then this bottom layer of the fluid will grab onto the next layer and what you see is this velocity profile that forms so we're asking which of these is going to be thicker uh, which boundary layer is going to be thicker so um, Hopefully you have some good intuition by uh, having a lot of experience with air and hopefully a little bit of experience with oil. Um, oil is a much more viscous fluid, so the boundary layer is going to be much thicker. So if we were to draw the velocity boundary layer for each of these, we might expect air to be quite thin actually and the oil to be much thicker, meaning that it's going to take a longer distance to go from zero velocity here at the solid fluid interface up to the free stream velocity um, which is denoted by u infinity up here and that's because the so the viscosity of the oil um, is creates a lot more viscous forces so the uh, momentum diffusivity so another way of thinking of this is that the momentum propagates its way up through the oil much more effectively because it has those much stronger viscous forces okay so let's continue with this thought so if air and engine oil, each at 300 Kelvin, are flowing at 1 meter per second over a flat plate in separate experiments, what is the thickness of the velocity and thermal boundary layers from each experiment? So now, in, so we're actually going to try and quantify, rather than just thinking about this conceptually, we're actually going to try and quantify the thickness of the velocity and thermal boundary layers. And let's assume now, since we'll have a thermal boundary layer forming, let's assume that that plate is now heated. So for whichever fluid, you'll have those viscous forces, which are going to create a velocity boundary layer, delta. You may also have a thermal boundary layer that forms delta T. So let's look at some of the equations that we looked at last time to try and come up with this. So we, from that similarity solution, we came out with this quite useful equation that delta which is the velocity boundary layer thickness is equal to 5x divided by the Reynolds number to the one-half power. So we would go through and calculate a Reynolds number for air at these conditions and a Reynolds number for oil at these conditions. So let's just do that. I'm going to skip the actual steps. You can go ahead and verify these calculations if you'd like on your own. I don't want to bore you with the details though. So at we're looking at a specific x at x equals 40 millimeters. So notice that the velocity boundary layer thickness is a function of x and the Reynolds number is actually also a function of x. So the Reynolds number itself changes depending on how far down the plate you go. 
So the Reynolds number for each of those, for air it is 2517, for oil it is 72.7. So very different Reynolds numbers. These are both laminar flow. This is something that we'll discover in later lectures, but unlike the critical Reynolds number for flow through a pipe, where you'd see a transition from laminar to turbulent at a Reynolds number of approximately 2,000, when you have flow over a flat plate, that critical Reynolds number is actually 100,000. So we're still very laminar for both of these, so this solution is still valid. And we'll talk more about that critical Reynolds number later and what it means. So after we calculate the Reynolds number for each of these, we simply take that Reynolds number, plug it in here, and then we plug in our x here. So our delta at that particular x for air is going to be 3.99, and this is in units of millimeters. For the oil, now again from our conceptual question we expected the oil's boundary layer to be much higher, and you notice because the oil has a lower Reynolds number which shows up in the denominator that makes the boundary thickness higher. So we get a velocity boundary layer thickness of 23.5 millimeters for the oil. Okay, so now we would want to calculate the thermal boundary layer thickness. So here is where we are going to use the Prandtl number. So if you recall, the Prandtl number is the ratio of momentum diffusivity to thermal diffusivity which is nu over alpha. So that's momentum diffusivity over thermal diffusivity. So the let's look at what those Prandtl numbers actually are. So this is something we would just look up in a table. So the Prandtl number for air is 0 0.707 and the Prandtl number for oil is 6400. So basically it's, this is telling us that um, relative so relative to its uh, to its momentum diffusivity the air is going to have a, an approximately equivalent thermal diffusivity whereas for the oil the oil has a much much larger momentum diffusivity relative to its thermal diffusivity so that will affect the uh, the thermal boundary layer thicknesses so the delta T also expressed in millimeters. Um, we would use this correlation that came from that similarity solution that the ratio of the velocity boundary layer thickness to the thermal boundary layer thickness is proportional to the Prandtl number to the one-third. And I say proportional, it's actually it is exactly the Prandtl number to the one-third power. So w the way that translates is that um, because air has a Prandtl number less than one, um, we actually end up with a thermal boundary layer that is a little bit thicker than the velocity boundary layer. So for air, the thermal boundary layer is 4.48 millimeters thick. So it's approximately on the same, I mean it's on the same order of magnitude, it's pretty close because that Reynolds, I mean that Prandtl number is reasonably close to one. So because there's going to be a big discrepancy here, the Prandtl number is really large for oil under these conditions, and so our thermal boundary layer thickness is only 1.27 millimeters. So um, if you recall, well let's, let's just move on here, let's take a look at a plot of these different boundary layer thicknesses. So here we have the velocity boundary layer thickness, no oh, sorry, on the left we have the air, sorry, with the boundary layer thickness on the y-axis and then how far down we are on the plate. So we did this calculation specifically at 40 millimeters or 0.04 meters, but here is what it would look like if we just plotted it over the full length of the plate from zero up to the um, 40 millimeters. So we have a velocity boundary layer, so here's our velocity boundary layer because of that relatively higher thermal diffusivity, the thermal boundary layer is a little bit thicker for the air. But there's a sharp contrast for the oil, so the oil has that Prandtl number of 6400, so that basically means, relatively speaking, that momentum propagates its way through the oil 
much better than heat propagates its way through the oil. So the oil has a relatively much thicker velocity boundary layer and a relatively much thinner thermal boundary layer. Okay, so if you recall some other things that came out of that similarity solution, one that's going to be very important is the Neusselt number and this correlation that comes out. So this is the correlation for the average Neusselt number and we can actually calculate the Neusselt number um, and subsequently calculate the uh, convective heat transfer coefficient for each of these different scenarios. So let's look at our next example problem. Um, again, same scenario. If air and engine oil each at 300 Kelvin are flowing at one meter per second over a flat plate, what is the local heat transfer coefficient for each fluid? So if you remember our procedure, we first evaluate the geometry. So this is a flat plate with, um, and I believe this is an isothermal plate. So we would go find the appropriate correlation to give us our Neusselt number under those geometry and flow conditions. We would then calculate our Neusselt number and then we would back solve our Neusselt number to give us our convective heat transfer coefficient. So the correlation that we would use, so this is asking the, for the local heat transfer coefficient. That last slide, this is actually the average because of that bar over the top. So the local under this particular scenario is given by this correlation, which we would find in our textbook and um, and on previous presentations. So the Neusselt number under these circumstances is 0 0.332 times the Reynolds number which is a function of x to the one-half power multiplied by the Prandtl number to the one-third power. So you, I don't think it's worth um, just basically think of this, this is an empirical correlation, this can be basically plug and chug. It's useful to have a little bit of intuition about what these things are, but um, uh, not particularly useful. I, I mean, it's difficult to wrap your head around sort of the physics of what this equation actually means, so you can just treat it as an equation. That's a correlation to give you the local Neusselt number. So let's generate our table again. So we have air, we have oil, we're going to have our Reynolds numbers and our Prandtl numbers. And then what's also going to be important is K, the thermal conductivity of the fluids. So our Reynolds number for air, as you recall, is 2517. And for oil, it's 72.7. The Prandtl number is 0 0.707. And for oil, it is 6400. So we'd want to look up the fluid thermal conductivities for each of these fluids and at this particular temperature. So for air, that thermal conductivity is 0 0.0263, and that is units of watts per meter per Kelvin. For oil, it is 0 0.1145. Okay, so what we would do is we would plug in these numbers. So Reynolds number goes here, Prandtl number goes here, and we would get the Neusselt number for each of these situations. So the Neusselt number, um, let's do this, so we're asked for a specific x, so at 40 millimeters in this particular case, our Neusselt number for the air is 14.8 and that's just plug and chug into that equation. And for the oil, it is 52.57. Okay, so then we would use this relationship. If you remember that the new silt number is equal to HL over K, in this particular case, our L or our characteristic length is, is how far you are down the plate. So we're actually gonna substitute our X in there over K fluid. So this is the definition of the Neusselt number. If you recall, the Neusselt number is a ratio of the total convective effects, which includes advection and conduction, relative to the effects of just conduction by itself. So uh, we would just solve this and for h. So here we would get h, which is going to be a function of x, but our x is 40 millimeters, is equal to our Neusselt number, also measured at that same x, um, 
multiplied by the thermal conductivity of our fluid and divided by our x. So our local heat transfer coefficient at x equals 40 millimeters for the air is 9.76 and this is units of watts per meter squared per Kelvin, just like the same units you should be used to from working with Newton's law of, law of cooling. For the oil, it is a 191 watts per meter squared per Kelvin. So you'll notice that even though the, um, the thermal diffusivity of the oil was much lower, relatively speaking, that Reynolds number um, and that advection effect actually help out the oil situation quite a bit. So we end up with a convective coefficient that's quite a bit higher for the oil. It also has quite a bit higher thermal conductivity, so that helps. So remember, um, convection is the combination of advection, which is like bulk fluid motion, and conduction, which is that more molecular fluid motion. So conduction is sort of a part of convection. So a fluid that has a higher thermal conductivity will also have a notice that by this K of the fluid here, a fluid that has a higher thermal conductivity will also generally have a higher convective coefficient, relatively speaking. Okay, so let's look at the different convection coefficients just plotted over time. So for air, we've got air on the left and oil on the right. And here you see as a function of X, you see that you have a relatively higher local heat transfer coefficient at the beginning of the plate, at the near the leading edge for and then gradually that decreases because that boundary layer grows thicker and thicker so the the there's more physical space for that heat to have to propagate through before it gets from the surface up to the bulk fluid um, or the free stream velocity of our system so let's compare these relatively speaking so you generally see that the oil because it's going to be more dense and it has a higher thermal conductivity um, and it has that higher Reynolds number as well, we have much higher convective coefficients for the oil than for the air. So the main takeaway from this is just I just wanted to walk you through the procedure of applying some of these correlations and what and what do these things physically mean. So it's a matter of so you have to first evaluate your system geometry. Okay, so we've just gone through this process where we evaluated the geometry. We had a flat plate under isothermal conditions. We evaluated our fluid and flow conditions. So we looked at our Reynolds number. In this case, we had laminar flow. We used our Prandtl number. We plugged those into a correlation to get, in this particular case, we generally wanted the local heat transfer, co well, the local Nusselt number. So from that local Nusselt number, we back solve using the Nusselt number equals HL over K. We back solve that for H to get our local heat transfer coefficient. So that's the basic procedure that you would use to figure out how to find H um, in, in a particular scenario.